Tim, but first I want to welcome David to London. Thank uh, you. It's David's first visit uh, to London, and uh, it's been absolutely wonderful having him here for a few days to give a public lecture at the Institute of Education. Uh, last night we saw a production of Comedy of Errors in Dari, an uh, Afghani Persian language at the Globe, and uh, this is the other event that we're, we're, we're taking part in today. But I wonder, David, if we could, in, in exploring hip hop and its various manifestations and its social setting and the politics of it today, we could start with you telling us something about how you discovered it. What, what took you, what attracted you to it? Right, right. Well, my, my induction, Richard, into hip hop, you know, um, started early on. I remember growing up as a kid in Detroit, Michigan, um, and this was during a post-industrial time, and that meant that the city, which is a large Midwestern industrial city in the United States, was losing, losing jobs rapidly. And if anybody in here knows about Detroit, Detroit relies upon its automotive industry. Um, around the 1980s, the, the bottom fell out the automotive industry, which meant a lot of people were out of work. And so there are conditions of chronic poverty. And with that came, you know, um, conditions and situations that were, you know, unkept. And, and, and really, you know, it placed the burden on homes and families. For that, I grew up with a single mother, you know, um, who became a sex worker in order to raise us. In order to cope with her pain, she began to abuse drugs um, and, and do other things. And I was left um, alone at home a lot. Um, and I spent a year homeless. And from homelessness, I went to my grandmother's house, you know, um, who was also on a fixed income. So there's this cycle of post-industrialism, poverty, you know, um, and the infliction of pain. And yet there was a silence around it. There was no way to, to really express how I was feeling, you know, and there's no medium to write that narrative. And hip hop became that narrative for me. So I remember early on, you know, listening to, you know, groups like Run DMC and, you know, um, Public Enemy and Public Enemy would articulate this, this, this visceral rage, you know, that we were feeling um, in ways that made sense. So while school was available, the things that were happening in school didn't necessarily make sense to me. While there was poetry, you know, um, like Keats and, 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 and Dickinson, you know, and, and beautiful things, that stuff didn't necessarily make sense to me. But Tupac did make sense to me, and Tupac made sense to me in powerful ways, in ways that got me politically engaged, in ways that helped me to become, you know, more socially and culturally enfranchised, in ways that you know, provided me a space to participate in my reality, to make sense of that reality and ultimately change it. So it, it sort of stems, it stemmed for you anyway, from, a, from an anger and a hurt. Yes. And I suppose that you may not have known it at the time and when you were young, but there's a, there's a politics around that. And, yes. And a sort of sense of protest coming out, uh, fighting up against things, things that were kind of constraining you or upsetting you. You, you, you talked a little bit about the kind of literary antecedents of hip-hop there, but, I mean, how do you see hip-hop linking to protest music or protest poetry? I mean, I'm thinking first, that's a long tradition in the UK. In, in the Middle Ages, uh, the Scots had a, had a form called the flight, yes. which was an attack, a, an expression of anger, a, a diatribe. So do you see hip-hop as kind of coming out of a long literary tradition. Yeah, well, I think it comes out of a long liter literary tradition, but I think it's informed by the same ideology, you know, um, of protest poets. Um, specifically, when we link hip hop, when we think of hip hop music, we think of the last poets. Um, we think of Gil Scott Heron, and we think of you know the traditions of Iceberg Slim. Um, but I, I can take it back even farther. So. The spoken word and the voice of you know, poets like Paul Lawrence Dunbar, who would you know um, spit poems in spoke uh, in the spoken word, um, like "We Wear the Mask," mm -hmm. which is an educative moment, right? It, it, it's providing us with information about hegemony and the success of it, you know, in providing you know this like false information to the masses, where the masses consent to their oppression. And a poem goes, and I want to you know just say some of it in spoken word, like like "We Wear the Mask." We were the mask that grins and lies, that hides our cheeks and shades our eyes. 
This debt we pay to human guile with torn and bleeding hearts we smile and mouth with myriad subtleties. Why should the world be overwise in counting all our tears and sighs? Nay, let them only see us while we wear the mask. We smile, but, O oh, great Christ, our cries to thee from tortured souls arise. We sing, but, O oh, the clay is vile beneath our skin and long the mouth. But let the world dream otherwise. We wear the mask. And so hip hop played on that tradition of voice. And, 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 and at one element, the lyrics, you know, are informative. But the performance of the lyrics, you know, gives a, a, another quality or at least another character to the information that's being transmitted. Um, and so... That performance, you know, extends longer than, you know, um, the Iceberg Slim or the Last mm -hmm. Points. And certainly they work within that tradition. And I see, you know, um, other artists, you know, from, you know, African literature as well as from, you know, European literature and even Asian literature, you know, who have used the word and the spoken voice, you know, um, to make similar comment, mm -hmm. social and political. Right. I mean, it's really nice you mentioned Gil Scott Heron because yes. he, I think he died last year. Um, there was a tribute. I just happened to be on my computer and suddenly uh, up came a live two, three hour tribute of a mix of some of his work. And that mix of the political and the beautifully lyrical yes. and, and musical thing, thing was just so uh, riveting for me. Can we, can we talk a bit about, uh, we'll come back to the sort of oppositional, the, the, the politics yes. of hip hop a bit, but let's, let's just talk about the form of it, the, the shape it takes. Um, could you say something maybe about the rhyme or the imagery, the sort of uh, shape of hip hop as, as you see it? Well, as, as I see it, as a, now as someone who has studied hip hop extensively as well as participated, you know, in, in, in various iterations of hip hop, you know, its shape, you know, um, arises from, you know, not necessarily what's seen on the page. And so if you look at a hip hop, you know, if you look at a rap, you know, um, it may or may not look like a conventional poem. But if you listen to a rap and you think about orality or the oral tradition um, that hip hop belongs to, we can begin to understand why things like rhyme is so, rhyme is so important, right? Mm -hmm. so, so rhyme is important in hip hop because it allows the artists to create not only an art, but you know, an agitation, a music that people can listen to. And rhyme is only one element, or at least one literary two, that drives forward mm -hmm. that message. Mm -hmm. um, the, the, the rhythm and the music, and you, and you can probably say more about the, and the rhythm, but the rhythm and the music, you know, um, it uses various other you know, lyrical devices. So if we think about um, Will Smith's first you know, um, group, Fresh Prince and J Jazzy Jeff, right? Where we get this alliteration, this mm -hmm. repetition of initial consonant sounds you know, um, in the front of words to create like a music. We also have you know, um, other you know, really interesting techniques that go along with language other than rhyme. Um, for instance, the, the consonant. So all rhymes don't, I mean, all words don't rhyme, right. and yet, Hip hoppers find ways to make words rhyme, um, the syllabication of rhymes. And so instead of you know, rhyming words, you know, part of the technique becomes rhyming um, syllables. Um, and if you can rhyme syllables you know, um, at the, you know, the, the level of you know, mono, you know, um, s s at, the, at the level of one syllable you know, um, units, you can begin to you know, put together pairs of words you know, that don't necessarily naturally go together, but in hip hop can go together mm -hmm. to create and drive a music. Okay. And I think that's important. Yes, yeah, so there's a whole com complex set of possibilities. Let's just take rhyme. That yes. Sometimes working internally within the line mm -hmm. uh, to sort of forge a, a unity or a repetition. Yes. And sometimes working, I guess, to pinpoint or mark the rhythm that is, that is moving through, through the poem. Um, so what I heard in, what, in, in the performance you just gave, which was great, is sometimes a longer line mm -hmm. ending with a rhyme, sometimes a shorter one. So all the time you're arrested uh, as a listener, uh, and maybe you are as, as the composer too, by shaping um, lines in rhythmic sequences which are accretive. In other words, there's a regularity yes. uh, uh, sort of underlaying the beat, but there's also an accretive layering uh, of, of the rhythm. And I suppose rhythm is important to me because I think often uh, the feeling is carried in the rhythm. There's, there's a physicality yes. uh, about it, and the words sometimes sit uh, sit on top. But can we just go back? You talked about 
the shape of what uh, hip, a hip hop or rap would look like on the page, um, with a lot of white space maybe around it. And I think you were suggesting it's almost like a script uh, for performance rather than something you would read Def all the time. Would, would that be fair to say? Yeah, definitely, definitely. I, and I, I think there's a conversation to be had about uh, the printed word, the lyric, you know, um, and the spoken word performed and how hip hop, you know, draws upon body and movement, mm. you know, and performance, um, tone and pitch, the rise and fall of notes, you know, um, that in some ways become sequestered on the page. And one thing that we do in, in, in hip hop is to begin to release that, to perform a new text. So hip hop on a page is much different than hip hop performed. And it's much different than hip hop seen. Because when you begin to see, the body becomes text along with the voice, along with the words that are um, you know, spoken or, 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 or spit. And so I think these elements, you know, when they come together, you, um, they conspire to create something that's beautiful, that's magical, that's musical, but also that's you know, um, beautifully powerful in a way that it can transcend you know, and bring about change and hope. Yeah. So, so uh, if we just draw on Ted Hughes's definitions of, of poetry, there were two or three nice phrases he used, explosive compression, yes. uh, a dance in words, so yes. sort of choreographic side of that. And then add to that uh, the 11-year-old uh, definition of poetry that I quoted to you the other day, writing that does not go up to the right-hand edge of the page, <laughs> which, which I like also. It's about yes. something shaped yes. there. Um, I guess what you're saying is there's a lot of modes. There's a multimodality about, about hip-hop. It exploits that whole range. It doesn't try to um, sift down or sift out other modes. It's more expansive, more embracing of a whole range of possibilities. Right. And if I may just sort of cue into thinking, you showed in a, the public lecture the other day at the Institute of Education wonderful examples by young people where they began to move or they thought hard about the moves. Can you say something about the physicality, the, the movement, the choreography of hip hop? Well, I, th I think it extends the language. And, and, and I would say there's a multimodality to hip hop, but I think that, that there is an organic, you know, plural modality to hip hop that, you know, existed before hip hop. You know, and I think one thing that hip hop does is that it resists in really ways, the ways that we formalized, you know, um, in, in really interesting ways, try to make singular the modes of expression um, that we articulate, that when we, are, when we ex express ourselves best, when we express ourselves for the purposes of you know, trying to utter the anger that may exist within, the rage that may exist within, or celebrate you know, the culture around, you know, we do so best within multiple modes, you know, using body, you know, image, and sound. You know, and when we extend hip hop beyond just the music, we see other modes you know, um, at play, like the writing on of walls, you know, um, and the beautifying as well as the politicizing of space. Mm. There, there becomes questions about, um, or become questions about um, who does that space belong to? Like you can put you know, a capitalist billboard on, uh, uh, on a wall in order to sell things and that's considered legal. But when a person in their neighborhood writes on a wall a name, to name that space, mm. you know, in some ways it's criminalized, it, it, it becomes illegal. And so there's that politics of space mm. within that mode mm. you know, of expression that's hip hop, also the body which becomes subject to really interest in penalty, you know, throughout history, becomes another space of expression through our tattoos and, you know, other um, forms of inking that also contain like a, a meaning making quality to them. And so I, I think the various modes of hip hop, you know, being unleashed, you know, leads to an expression that's freer and far more complex than, you know, what we usually get inside of the mainstream, and that's this movement to push us to narrow modes um, versus, you know, um, more expanded yeah. modes. Yeah, we can come on and talk about that a little bit later in terms of education, Yes, uh, because I think there's, there's a lot of narrowing down that goes on in education. But let's just stick with the idea of, of hip-hop. You mentioned a couple of great words in, in your last um, little speech there, which was... Uh, beauty and politics. They yes. don't often associate, they don't often go together. But um, do you see hip hop as oppositional, not, not just expressive of anger and hurt and uh, maybe other things, maybe a lyricism and beauty too, but um, also oppositional in the sense of its ideology, its, its resistance or yes. its attack on, on wider social and political matters? Well, well there, there's a question. Um, opposition implies a direction. 
you know, um, opposition over to whom? It's like in, in the states, we talk about westward expansion. And, and usually the idea of westward expansion is, you know, um, this uncomplicated notion. Obviously, you know, the people who expanded westward, you know, um, was a particular group. But there was also people who were living west. And the question is, was it expansion for them? So, so the question is, is hip-hop oppositional or has mainstream culture opposed to people? And is hip-hop the voice that expresses and makes known that opposition of, you know, large governments and other, you know, big interests, you know, um, in, in its attempt to oppress the people? And so I think that hip-hop is a response to opposition. And the rage is a response to opposition versus, you know, um, hip-hop being oppositional. Certainly, you know, um, it stands in contrast and counter to, you know, um, certain dominant ideologies that work to oppress and, you know, can, and sustain, you know, forms of oppression. Mm -hmm. um, so it does become a vehicle and a voice, you know, um, of the masses to begin to articulate, you know, um, these moments and expressions of freedom. And I think freedom is the big part yeah. about it. So if we yeah. go back to the literary yes. quality of um, hip hop, and we think about, you know, hip hop as the voice of the people, moving away from constraining discourses and, and constraining forms, you know, it becomes free. And it becomes mm. free in really interesting ways, where when you begin to rap and you begin to articulate yourself, or write on walls and write on bodies, these are practices of freedom, to use Pato Fede's term, right? And, and it's something about the practice of freedom, you know, um, that moves us to another place. We can call it oppositional. And I mean, I mean, that becomes ironic, right? Mm -hmm. When freedom and practicing freedom is mm -hmm. oppositional mm -hmm. to what, right? I mean, to, to, to accepting bondage, or it can be seen as, you know, moving against opposition mm -hmm. and bringing us more toward these emancipatory and liberating spaces. Right, and, le and let's talk about the sort of lyricism and beauty of, of hip hop for a minute, because the anger doesn't always manifest itself yes. in, in a sort of, uh, how, in opposition necessarily. Let's talk more about this sort of voice and the liberation. You, you mentioned freedom yes, yes. and lyricism. Can well, you say more about I, the, again, the so, so, spirit of hip hop? So, so Du Bois, um, W.E.B. Du Bois, an, an American sociologist, writer, and um, thinker, he said that all art, you know, is propaganda. And there, there have been artists, you know, um, within the states and abroad who have taken issue with that. But I, I take, you know, um, Du Bois' point, you know, um, seriously, in a sense that Paulo Fede, you know, um, argues that when you enter into a, a classroom space or any other space, you're not entering into a neutral space, you're entering into a political space. So that, that space is politically complicated and implicated by, you know, histories, you know, um, and traditions of, you know, interests, you know, um, that are almost always at war. And so it, it's like the axiom, if a tree falls in a forest, does it make a sound? Of course it do, does, if trees fall in forest and make sounds, right? So, so the art is political, mm. you know, but that doesn't mean that it can't be beautiful too, because I don't think politics and beauty are in opposition. In fact, I think beauty is one of our most political forms and one of our most brilliant political ideas, especially when you have regimes that suggest that only certain things can be beautiful. And, and it's great to do this, this talk in the ICA because you, in thinking about multimodality, as yes. uh, colleagues of mine and, and I and others think about it at the Institute of Education, I think a whole area that we haven't really explored yet is the aesthetics of multimodality. Yes. Of course, the ICA artists, musicians are thinking about that a, a, a lot of the time. So I think there's something there we can, we can move forward on, as well as we're trying to, uh, how can I say, put multimodality within a wider frame of rhetoric, a contemporary rhetoric, which is multilingual, yes. uh, multimodal, yes. uh, and multimedia in terms of the, the, the hardware that it presents itself on. Um, but let's, let, let's use this as a segue into thinking about schooling, because we, we both have a, an engagement with schools, with helping young people to develop and get their way through the education system and lead a Right. fulfill life. So given there are some pretty narrow definitions of literacy around, particularly here in this country, probably in the States too, I mean, the, the ability to read and write, if you look it up in a, right. in a, in a dictionary. And the ability that, to read and write particular forms, particular yeah. print forms. Yeah. Right. Okay. Let, why don't you use that as a cue to go on and say, well, what, what can hip hop contribute 
to Well, well I think I think that. the first thing that hip hop contributes to the pedagogical imagination, you know, um, in the US and abroad is that it extends notions you know, um, of how we consider language and how we consider literacy and what is considered to be language and what can be considered to be literacy. There's a question about whether or not what we're teaching in classrooms, let's take for instance an English classroom, you know, is relevant, you know, not only to our students' lives but to our students' futures. Um, so let's um, take for instance, the um, a McDonald's commercial in the United States, you know, that's using um, hip hop language and hip hop artists to sell hamburgers, and yet we outlaw hip hop in school. So McDonald's will use hip hop in order to market a product to you know youth, which is problematic and, and on many levels, and yet youth can't enjoy and study you know um, their language within schools. Now, now one thing that I will say in terms of you know the literate product of hip hop is the creativity you know that's involved. So we think of simile as, you know, um, a metaphor that uses, um, you know, the condition of like or as. Yet in hip hop, we have similes that imply like or as. So Nicki Minaj in a song might say, you know, um, I take away her hair and then she'll say nair after it. Well, she means like nair. <laughs> and so the, what's implied there is the like, and it's still, it's still a simile, and it still yeah. works in really interesting ways. And there are other you know, really inno mm. innovative ways of thinking about language and thinking about text and thinking about reality and putting together reality. McDonald's is smart enough to understand that there is a language and that there is an expression that speaks directly to people, and yet schools aren't. And that becomes interestingly problematic. So in school, and if you think about school literacy, we're preparing kids not for the 21st you know, century or the 22nd century. We're preparing kids for the 19th century. Or well, possibly the 18th in England. And, and possibly the 18th <laughs> in England, right? And, and the other thing, in the States, we have this huge standards movement. Really, I mean, and, and so this becomes like one issue around, you know, not bringing hip hop into the classroom as a vehicle to teach kids and to enhance their literacies because it doesn't you know, fit within the mm. standards. Well, I've argued in other places that you can learn as much from you know, um, Tupac as you can from Fitzgerald. The literary devices are there. You know, some of the language techniques are there. But what's there is the rich social commentary. And the question here is, what is the goal of education? Dewey said the, goal, the aim of education shouldn't be to teach a child what to think, but how to think. And I think hip hop, you know, um, in, in a lot of its problem posing of society and, and a lot of its construction of some of the ills of society puts, in a, puts us in a place mm. to do that. But we have a standards movement that, you know, suggests that we can't do it, mm. um, which is problematic. And if we think about the etymology of that term standard, right, um, you, you, know where the, you know where the word standard comes from, right? Standard, we, we have standard bearer, someone who carries yeah. the flag. But before mm -hmm. it um, stood for the flag, it stood for the phalanx, the army. So, so, so we're talking about armies, and, and in my conception of armies, armies are uniform. They're the same, not only the same in dress as uniform, but also the same in thought. And the question is whether or not we want people to think the same. And, and in thinking the same and being the same, they become cogs, you know, who are more susceptible to, you know, fascist ideas. And we saw this happen in 19, you know, 40, you know, to 1945. And we probably see it happening in other ways throughout society. So schools become this really interesting instrument of, you know, um, the state apparatus in order to create this uninvolved citizenry who can't critically and complicate things through a standards movement that leaves out the culture of kids. Mm -hmm. So, so uh, I guess what you're saying is that the demotic, the, the, the voice yes. of the everyday, which I'm, I can almost feel a rap coming on, a, along with demo democratic, yes. uh, has, are very important to, uh, they're like the base of an iceberg of communication. You yes. know, it's really present in people's lives the whole time. The classroom mm -hmm. frames a particular kind of language, yes. and the further that gets away from the language of the people, the demotic, yes. the less relevant, the less engaged schools become. Uh, the less engaged young people become, the relationship, and, and the more to break oppressive out. schools become. And I think I think that I think that piece is important because what happens is, by virtue of um, enabling one form over another, we say really interesting things. So, for instance, in the states, when we say um, and we use Matthew Arnold's axiom, "the best that's thought and said," and when the best that's thought and said is almost always, you know, white and male, that says to us a lot 
And not, it doesn't say that, you know, white men can't say great things because they can. I love, um, you know, Churchill and, you know, and, and some of his, you know, um, axioms. But it also says that if you don't fit that model, if you don't fit that identity, and if you enjoy something that may be different, or if you sound and speak a different way, that what you say, what you like, what you feel, who you are, you know, doesn't occupy the space of best. Yeah. In fact, it occupies the space of worse. It becomes, you know, vilified in really interesting ways. And so I think that there is a, a movement or should be a movement within schools, you know, um, that's more democratic to represent uniquely the voices of people, not only to engage them, but because this information, this stuff makes sense anyhow. And, 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 and if we think about how schools have evolved, it's a wonder why we haven't moved toward incorporating new ways of representing our human experience. Literature perhaps started as, you know, experience and song. You take Beowulf, mm -hmm. it's probably a, probably a really beautiful song, you know, the song yeah. at some point. It, it was hip hop, it was rap. Um, you take Chaucer, it, 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 it's lyrical, and it's, it was probably song. Some of the plays of Shakespeare, certainly the play we saw last night, did play on some of the poetics of song. Um, and now we use that information. We use this music in order to understand who we are. We study it. And, and, and so that comes out of an oral, an oral tradition uh, yes. that in many ways has been added to and overlaid by the whole book revolution from the 14th century right through to now, and now the digital revolution. Yes, and, and so, 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 so the book, the book rev revolution, you know, um, you know, in some century was the digital revolution. Yeah. It was the way that we recorded our human experience. It was the way that we record, and now we have different ways to do it. Right. We have different ways to record that experience. And so th th there's a question, why isn't these different ways, you know, privileged within classrooms? Sure. Let's talk a bit about digi digitization. Yes. We, we, we know uh, a mutual friend who did a PhD with you yes. at New York, uh, Mia Domingo, but she did her empirical data work uh, near Heathrow Airport, uh, Hounslow, with the Filipino-British community. Yes. Let's just talk uh, about the sort of work she did a little bit, because uh, you can probably describe it better than I can, but I'll, 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 I'll get it going by saying, um, as I understood it, she was looking at young Filipino-British people, issues of migration, how they felt about their identity, and the, they were creating sound poems, works, songs, rap that they were putting online and broadcasting around the world, particularly back to the Philippines, but also elsewhere. Right, right. Uh, do you see this as part of a, a more globalized or international dimension to hip hop? I mean, we started with you in Detroit and, and, and the origins of hip hop for you, but what do you feel about it now in terms of you know, a fast changing world? Well, I, I think, I think Mir's, and Mir, is a, Mir was a graduate student of mine. She's now a visiting professor at New York University. Um, what I found fascinating about Mir's work um, and I still find fascinating about it, is not only the location of hip hop and the types of work that it does for a group of Filipino youth, you know, um, here in the UK. And, and that work is similar to the work that it's doing for, you know, um, youth around the globe. But the ways that, you know, um, these Filipino youth hybridized hip hop. So hip hop, this, you know, um, contemporary African American aesthetic, you know, in the voices of these Filipino youth becomes, you know, very much, you know, Filipino in resistance to, you know, um, the type of cultural domination that these youth were experiencing here. And so they clung to hip hop in order to, you know, protect or preserve mm -hmm. their Filipino identity, um, which is one thing. And I think the hip hop also gave them a way to speak since many of them lost their Tagalog, mm. um, a way to speak back to other Filipino youth, you know, who are also involved in hip hop in the Philippines. So it became this, you know, um, transcontinental, you know, um, discourse, this pigeon, this um, language of exchange between um, groups who felt similar things and yet shared, you know, um, similar cultural roots. And she talks about that movement, that trans, you know, um, that the transcultural and that trans, you know, national, you know, movement, you know, through the music, and how that transnational movement also moved things like literacy. It moved identity. It moved um, positions of power and other things and authority within 
this vehicle and this vessel um, uh, uh, of the music, yes. hip-hop. So migration almost becomes a, an, an inner activity for them that they can re-express in that hybrid form as they, as they find their way through multiple identities yes. and hybridize them. Yes. I mean, I've always felt that there is this sort of tension, or maybe not, not a tension, between the single lyrical voice, which many movements have tried to encourage, both in education and yes. in literature, and also the hybridized multiple voices that we, we've, we've just been talking about. Yes. And I guess there's, they're, they're both there, aren't they? Yes. There's the expressive, but there's also the sort of yeah. range of identity, too. Yes. Yeah. We've had a great time talking. I mean, I wonder if we could invite people from the audience to uh, throw questions, particularly at David, because we don't want... We could keep on talking for the whole hour, but uh, we're very happy to take questions and open up, open up the dialogue a bit. Sure. Thank it's you. great to see that you're kind of bringing hip hop into like the, the classroom, just generally speaking. But um, I want to say, don't you think there's something a bit um, limiting about speaking about hip hop in an academic manner? Uh, when we try to get people to understand hip hop and, and culture that comes from like a folk or a grassroots existence, talking about it in terms of feeling and experience and using technical terms is only going part of the way to getting people to understand the value of that kind of culture. Yeah, I, I, I completely agree. And I, I generally talk about hip hop in education and I talk about hip hop education. I think that hip hop is naturally educative to people who listen to it. You know, many of us found our history, we found ourselves, you know, through hip hop. We, we, we learned to write and speak, you know, um, and gain voice through hip hop. And that didn't come from a classroom. And I don't think that, you know, um, belongs in a classroom because what happens when we bring hip hop in the classroom like that, we begin to analyze hip hop the meter and, and, it, just, and, and it just, it can bust, right? I mean, it, it destroys the form and it's no longer fun and it's no longer ours. And I, and I think that's tragic, but I think hip hop in the classroom can be used, you know, for really interesting purposes. Um, for instance, to discuss things like misogyny. And I gave an example um, a, a couple days ago in my talk about the term dime piece, you know, and what it means. Like, like a dime piece, you know, in, in really interesting ways means a beautiful woman. And yet when we take that further, it means a beautiful woman only in that she's a 10 on a scale of 1 to 10. And when we place, and in order to have a scale of 1 to 10, we place women back on this really interesting auction block, right? You know, um, which becomes like this misogynistic moment that women have endured before. And yet in hip hop, it doesn't feel misogynistic at all. And so there's this type of semantic inversion. And so these are the types of conversations that we can have in class when we bring hip hop to class. And I would even dare say that, you know, we don't have to bring hip hop to class because in the States, most of my students will come with their, you know, hats, hats flipped to the back or, you know, their tattoos on or a Run DMC shirt. They bring hip hop into the classroom and we just ignore it. You know, and, and I think what I'm arguing for is to begin to give, you know, some type of acknowledgement within our pedagogical space, you know, um, to the things that are critically important to youth um, and critically important to how we will understand who we are in our human experience. Um, and so I think, I think it, it's important to begin to recognize, bring within you know, um, to our, our, our teaching, you know, what's already there. And that's, you know, youth culture and the things that youth privilege. Well, how do we do it in a safe way? I argue for a third space, third spaces. And a third space is this space of confluence between um, the official world of school and the unofficial world of, uh, of youth, where youth can bring in a rap song and a teacher doesn't necessarily have to be expert. The teacher can occupy the space of learning and the student can occupy the space of teaching. You know, and, and really interesting, generative, problem-posing type conversations can arise from that, you know, dynamic. Yeah, and if I can just add to that, I think that, that really opens up uh, the fact that the, the spaces between what's in the classroom and in schools and what's outside, those are more permeable. And teachers, yes. th th than often teachers admit, but I think teachers who have become aware of the possibilities of this sort of discourse, can make the connections, can be open to, sensitive to, respectful of, yes. and 
sort of if, if there's a moment uh, in a class, I think training as a teacher is training to be ready for a moment that, that comes unexpectedly you know, in, in someone's learning. Someone brings in something or they, they perhaps just make a reference uh, to hip hop or, the, or they've, they've won a competition you know, and that's not recognized by the school, but a teacher aware of that can bring that into the classroom, build on it and use that wonderful E.M. Forster phrase, um, only connect. I think that's such a great phrase for particularly 11 to, say, 18-year-olds to make those connections between different parts of culture uh, and be fluent, be prepared to abandon your lesson plan and yet incorporate some of the principles you wanted or the outcomes you were trying to get to via other right. means by being sensitive, by, by being improvisatory at times. Right. But that means building up a sensibility, a rich range of repertoire and awareness that you can... Right. Transform. I mean, we, I think we both think that classrooms are about transformation. Uh, if, if some transformation doesn't take place in the 60 minutes that you're in a class with someone, then was it worth turning up at all? Right. That, that might be a small transformation. You might learn a little technical thing, or it could be a major transformation, a whole new oral genre, a whole new sense of self might be opened up to somebody. Uh, so I think schools ought to be dynamic places places of, they're social, but it's about engineering the social in order to make something happen mm -hmm. in people's minds. Right. Well, now that being acknowledged, the it's a challenge, but I think that, um, I mean, assessment, I'll leave out of the question. How do you assess that? Uh, in terms of how do you encourage a staff to build up that sort of um, repertoire? I mean, I think it came, for me, teaching in the East End of London when I was a teacher, it meant we were challenged uh, every day as teachers. I remember cycling to school and thinking, you know, counting the lamppost and thinking, Right, you know, I've got to prepare myself to be on the top of my game every day because these kids are going to challenge me. Right. And uh, that's where I learned the most as a teacher uh, because I'm always having to connect with their experience and, um, and, if you like, what I was bringing to them in terms of the frameworks, the frameworks for my own uh, development as a teacher, the curriculum frameworks I'm having to operate in that the government or curriculum policymakers design the school frameworks of the particular ethos uh, of the school. And it's always a sort of negotiation, yes. um, uh, a dynamic. I mean, I remember very much when the national curriculum was first instituted here about 20 years ago, um, uh, a teacher telling me that a child came into a class, a very young child, with a fossil, and uh, that he or she had got over the weekend and said, look, you know, this looks really interesting. I found it on a beach. And the teacher said in one of these anecdotes, I'm sorry, we don't have time to look at that today. Oh, yeah, wow. We have a curriculum to follow. Uh, but I think the teacher, we need to help teachers to develop, to say not that, but that is fantastic. It's great you've brought that in. And then instantly on their feet to make the connections with what they were going to do mm -hmm. and somehow celebrate that moment. It might just be for two minutes. It might even be for 30 seconds or it might form the basis of another lesson, or whatever. But I think the negotiated curriculum is really important. It's about what happens uh, in the classroom, and what happens in the mind, not in some piece of paper that's uh, in a cupboard somewhere. Yeah. David, I don't know what you think about it. Well, well uh, in the context of the, of the state, there's a question about what works. Um, and that question has been, you know, um, an ongoing question for, you know, decades. And what I see is a, a, a set of practices that don't work well for the majority of the student population. And what the U.S. government and, and P policymakers who um, are over education have done is instead of trying something new, they've doubled down on what fails, um, which, seems, which seems really foolish, right? Um, we know that the ultimate outcome is this transformation that Richard is talking about. It's learning. And I would say we would measure it based on, you know, um, whether or not students are learning, 
you know, and, and that's, that's, the, that's the outcome that we're looking for. And if, if I can get a student engaged in school by listening to lyrics, you know, a student who may not be engaged from reading traditional texts, and that student learns and moves from one developmental level to the next, you know, um, I think that that's, a, that's an accomplishment, mm -hmm. and I think it's a worthy one. Yeah. And if you may just add and give another example, I mean, it's a difficult problem, this. You, you've, yeah. you've really got to put a lot of energy and thinking into it. Right now in the UK, there's a strong emphasis on phonics uh, in the teaching of reading mm -hmm. for, for younger children. Some of, the, um, old, well, some of the contemporary textbooks that are being created about it appear to give examples that are almost nonsensical. It's just sounds that are, that are being recited, like uh, the... Uh, without meaning, you know, the nip skipped uh, and you know, opened a pip. But then I'm thinking, as I'm listening to rap and hip hop, uh, a, a little bit of nonsense like that, why not kind of be more creative about that and build it into something that becomes fun, exciting, yeah. can bring in other aspects. You, you then think, actually, this phonics thing could be really interesting if I draw on literature that kind of draws on it, um, or I get children to tell stories and experiment in, in ways that they can engage with, rather than just being a technical thing outside themselves. Right. Um, I mean, we talked earlier, just before the talk, about the fact that education tends to strip down to a particular mode, uh, what is indeed multimodal communication that happens all the time. Yes. So the stripping down to a system and then teaching that system is actually not a very sophisticated uh, uh, pedagogy. It doesn't, actually doesn't work in a lot of cases. So I think we've got to, as educators, got to think, how, how can we work with that? And it's damaging. How can we achieve it? So and, it's, it's, and it's damaging. I think, I think the other thing is to you know, really begin to indict you know, um, the official curriculum in ways that you know, rob us of creativity. Um, in the ways that you're talking about. I know in the context of US schools, creativity is no longer you know, um, uh, a, a goal you know, in education. Other things are, and there's this um, emphasis on STEM you know, um, disciplines, science, technology, engineering, and math, you know, um, to the, um, the blatant disregard you know, of the arts and other forms of creativity. And these creative moments that you're talking about, Richard, from the teacher, the, the flexibility that mm -hmm. it may take you know, um, to engage a teachable moment, but also other creative moments that you know, students may bring in you know, um, to the classroom that can create you know, um, a type of liberal thinker. Mm -hmm. you know, and, and it's not clear to me that's the goal of education, you know, um, at least in you know, some of the major industrialized nations. And yet it feels like that is the most important goal of education and we've moved far away. Well, I come back to some of the challenge you put, you put to us a bit earlier. I mean, how do you transform a school? How do you make it relevant? How do you ensure kids do the best they can possibly do? That's right. what you You can't do it on your own. You've got to, uh, I mean, I always think in terms of teacher development, it's good to go along with another teacher at least to a conference or to a talk and then come back, talk about those things, maybe support each other in the classroom. But bringing parents on board is about performance, uh, about showcasing what goes on in school, yes. about being open to them coming in, supporting kids, so that they have feel and ownership in the learning themselves. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that the leafy Surrey parent um, would love to see their children achieving uh, finished pieces or right. works in progress. I mean, you just have to kind of make it clear what, what is going on. Uh, and celebrate that and, you know, let that build more confidence. Right. I think a lot of this is to do with confidence in yourself as a learner right. um, and finding the mechanisms, the uh, spaces to, to share that with, uh, with parents. I mean, parent power is very important. It must be in the States too, but it's very increasingly, increasingly important uh, in schooling here. And um, uh, it's about openness, I think, about transparency. What are we trying to do here? But 
I, I don't ever want or never have in my teaching sell young people short of maximum achievement. That's right. I mean, that's, it's all part and parcel of the same thing. It's a question that's of how right. you get there. Right. And Matt. Yes. Mm. Mm. Right. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Well, one. Mm. Yeah. Well, if I just pick that up and uh, and uh, open it up, I mean, one of the most uh, I, I studied English language and literature and became an English teacher, secondary English teacher. Uh, did a research project on sixth form or sixteen to eighteen English at one point in comparison to other subjects, politics, sociology, English, biology, and what. And there was a spectrum of uh, engagement with argumentation, in other, engagement with right. critical independent thought in all of those subjects. One of the most depressing uh, quotations I ever had from uh, an interview with a child was, in English, 16 to 18, we all end up thinking the same. Oh, wow. and, and that was because the teacher, well, I can, I can understand why, what the teacher was doing, trying to build a consensus, trying to uh, get the kids to appreciate literature, right. but probably taking too strong a line of not allowing them space or, or space into it. Right. Whereas in politics and sociology, they were dealing with uh, subjects where they were encouraged to think differently and challenge theory and, and so on. Um, and uh, in the STEM subjects, funnily enough, particularly biology, uh, teachers and pupils were saying, well, we, we don't even begin to argue uh, or, or develop critical thoughts in this field because we don't know, and all the teachers were saying, the young people don't know enough. Right. Well, uh, that's an interesting... It's problematic. Uh, it is problematic, and um, I think we've got to open up those spaces so that discussion... Yeah, so we get challenged as teachers. And I, I love D.H. Lawrence's um, um, maxim about learning. It's... it's, it, it's uh, almost in the form of a poem, where he says, um, he or she who learns from someone who's learned all they, uh, who, who has learned all they have to learn, uh, drinks from a standing pool. Right. But he or she who learns from someone who is still learning, drinks from a running stream. So you've got to get away from this sense that the teacher knows everything. Right. I think the teacher's got to be a, a superb um, manager and designer of learning situations mm -hmm. to, to maximize what goes on in the classroom. And, and let, me, let me just say something quickly, Matt, to, you, to um, the, the question you asked. Um, to those parents, and I, I think that we have to make multiple arguments to you know, multiple populations or publics. If a kid come ho comes home and says that they've learned rap, you know, that's one thing. But if a kid comes home and say that they learned how to think about a variety of social situations through rap. That's quite another thing. And, and I, think, I think that what, what I'm arguing for us to appreciate is the learning through rap. You know, I'm, and I would love if we, learn, if we learned rap, learned about rap, but learning through rap is what, what I think is important because I think that kids are learning through rap and I think that teachers can use, you know, um, hip hop, rap, and a lot of other things that youth are into, you know, um, to help teach, you know, lessons that will enlighten them as informed citizens. Yes, sure. Hi, thanks. It's just been really interesting. Um, I worked as a teaching assistant in um, a Hackney secondary school um, until quite recently, so it'd be quite relevant to what you're talking about. So, yeah, out of my own experience, I think, um, you know, working in a year seven classroom and they were learning about Benjamin Zephaniah, but one of his novels, the sort of levels of engagement that you get with that kind of subject matter mm -hmm. is just so much more relevant, actually, to, to their day-to-day -day lives than, you know, learning about 18th century poetry, for example. Um, so I think, you know, engagement primarily, especially in um, more difficult schools where obviously behaviour management is, is a massive issue as well, when the children are actually, like, mm. are interested in what they're, they're being taught, then that's, that's, you know, immediately um, really good. Um, and I'm just wondering, um, in relation to literacy, because you mentioned that um, earlier on, you know, the school I was working at had, you know, quite a high percentage of, of you know, um, secondary school pupils who still couldn't read. And for me, that was primarily because of some of the materials they were working with, yes. which were just completely um, mm. not relevant mm. to what they were doing. They were very right. childish. 
Mm. I'm wondering whether, yeah, elements of hip hop, elements of rap, that kind of a different mode could be used um, in literacy. Yeah, I think so. I think definitely. And, and there are a few groups. Um, Flocabulary writes hip hop curriculum. Um, there was another group called um, called the Hip Hop Notebook. They write curriculum, um, first wave, and out of the University of Wisconsin writes um, hip hop. But I think what you get at are some really interesting consequences to the current system of education that we have and the misplaced adjectives. We expect youth, you know, um, simply to drink from the cup that we have as if they don't have anything in them that are, um, are already there, um, and, that, and, and as if they you know, um, will readily accept whatever we give them to drink. And we do things like label them. And I said this in my talk on, um, on Wednesday um, at the Institute of Education, is that you know, we call these youth who won't read in our classrooms disengaged readers. And I bet if we followed many of those youth outside of the classroom, we will find them not only reading, but engaged in text in really interesting ways. So if they're not engaged in classrooms, but are engaged outside of classrooms, are they really disengaged? And I've argued that the, the youth aren't disengaged. They're very engaged, yet in ways that we don't see. And the classrooms are disengaging. The texts are disengaged. And part of the reason is a, are, are fundamentals to learning, but also fundamentals to literacy learning. You're not gonna read a text that you don't find interesting at first. You're not gonna learn to read until you find interest in reading. And so we've articulated the basics as reading, writing, and arithmetic, and, and yet those feel like really interesting um, intermediate skills to me. The basics are probably things like pleasure and play and curiosity. And when we begin to think about you know, those things as the basics, it, 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 it positions us in relation to learning, in relation to literacy quite differently. And so instead of you know, um, forcing a text that a kid you know, is finding you know, um, ponderous, we can begin to think about you know, ways to lighten the load and help kids to engage you know, in literacy in ways that they find meaningful and in ways that they may find pleasure and in ways that they may find you know, um, a lot of curiosity. Yeah, and if I can just build on that and, and, and respond to your question too, I think uh, I just want to make a small plea for 18th and 17th century literature <laughs> or from any, any place. I mean, I think you could take 10 lines of Dryden, let's take the 17th century, satire, mock, epic. Yes. You know, that's a great form for adolescents. You know, they, they operate uh, in, the, in, in that form, a lot of parody, uh, and write it in different versions. You know, that, that's a nice educative thing to do. But t taking th your point about the... Uh, maybe some young people who find it difficult even to kind of read and write the basics uh, yeah, as they enter secondary school and all that that brings with them in terms of their own self-image and their place in society and so on. Um, there have been some great studies at the Institute even decades ago uh, saying that with young people like that, first of all, you've got to get them to um, express something about something they know about, something they feel confident about. That could be orally. It could be recorded. Uh, it could be transcribed by someone. They could um, uh, then be shown, this is your work, you know, but we've transcribed it for you. Do you want to change it in some way? I, I think developing as a reader, particularly if you have problems with it, often comes from in, um, plowing the ground first as a composer, as a writer, mm. with something to say. And that's, David, this goes back to the very beginning of our conversation. You're talking about your experience in Detroit. You had something to say yes. there, and you wanted to uh, get it out. And that reciprocal relationship between expression, uh, saying something, composing, and reading, uh, being an audience, is, is something to really build on. It takes time. No one's saying this, this is easy, but it's about building confidence, um, engagement with a young person like that who finds it difficult to read, and with text, text that they've actually created in some form themselves. So I think creativity as well comes back. Yeah. Yes. Well, yes. That's what really engages students I find. Yes. Um, because they want to express themselves, they want to be creative and so they have to find the tools to do that, which is yeah. you know, learn to read and write something. Yeah. Yeah. And then there's multimodality. I mean the, the, the links between visual image and word, moving image and words. We're, we're, we're moving at the Institute of Education, like many art schools now, toward dissertations that be, that can be in multiple forms. Uh, in digitized forms, there's a lot of ways in for young people. And if they find, if they feel confident in one mode, they can build communicative competence and capability and excellence in due course uh, gradually. Mm -hmm. But maybe we could 
just take one more question, Matt, because we, would that be okay? I would, I would deal with both. You know, I think in a conversation e in that I was having about um, Dime Piece is that the classroom becomes now a space that's open to, be, to talk about these issues, mm -hmm. whether or not it's, you know, um, an inversion of an injustice or whether or not it, it reinforces an injustice, you know, becomes subject to conversation. You know, um, and typically in classrooms, those conversations, you know, are held at bay. Um, and so I would love if, if youth are engaged in, in, in this world of language and that language carries, um, you know, um, these thumbprints of, you know, um, of, of oppression. I think that, you know, talking about the language of hip hop gives us an opportunity to begin to discuss exactly what you say. Um, but, but I think it's important, you know, because we do this too much is not to, you know, criminalize and demonize hip hop. You know, so for instance, we talk about misogyny in hip hop or violence in hip hop and um, the glorification of material in hip hop, profanity in hip hop, as if hip hop created those things. And yet when I, you know, look, you know, through, you know, um, my own literatures, you know, those things are alive and, and, and alive in force in, the, in that literature. When I look at culture, mass culture and dominant culture, you know, those things are alive in, in mass culture. And so hip hop in some ways, you know, borrows from. But I do want to, you know, make known that hip hop in, in its truest form, though it may borrow from, you know, um, uh, an oppressive item, you know, sometimes it has the power to do really interesting things to invert that oppressive item. And I'm thinking about things like the N-word. Um, or even um, other pieces of vocabulary that have been used to strike against people. So when hip hoppers use the word nigga, delete the ER, they, they don't mean the same thing as the N word with the ER. In fact, they've taken the word back and they've populated with, populated it with something that's really powerful. Like yes. Yes. I'm, if it's okay with you, Matt, uh, I think we do have to uh, leave. David has to catch a plane uh, from Heathrow very shortly, yes. and uh, we're going to need to leave. But I, but I do want to say, before you um, sum up, Matt, uh, first of all, thank you for having us uh, here at the ICA, and thanks the audience for, for giving up a nice sunny lunchtime. But